All right, well, hey, folks. Uh, my name is Rob Satram with Feedback Ranch. We got a podcast, YouTube channel going here, and we help entrepreneurs and small businesses move upward and forward. I'm here with Darian Wiggs of Wiggs CPA, based out of Chicago, and uh, we're just delighted. We want to share a little bit. Um, Darian has started an accounting firm. He's a certified public accountant, and I'm excited because Darian, of all the people I've met, has been the one that like I mentioned something he should do. He executes it at a 10 quickly, easily, and he has done so much work to get to the point to where he is. And and uh, why don't you just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your journey and how you started Wig CPA. Um, Totally built his website. Um, proud of what he's been doing. He's he's just killing it, serving tons of small business owners. Um, so if you're in Chicago and just right off the bat, head to wigcpa.com if you like the idea of working with a proactive tax planner. But why don't you introduce yourself? Help us get to know you a little bit and uh, catch us up with your yeah. story thus far. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this opportunity for a while. So I wanted to say thank you. But yeah, as Rob mentioned, uh, yeah, my name is Darion Wiggs. Uh, I am from basically the south side of Chicago, the south suburbs. And uh, yeah, I started my accounting firm, Wiggs CPA Tax and Accounting, back in October 2022. Uh, after graduating from school, I got my master's degree in accounting C from the University of Illinois. Uh, and I took the CPA exam there and I took the traditional route where I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went to Big Four. Uh, I, did, I was an auditor at EY, thought I found my dream job. And then after working there for a year, I instantly realized like, ah, th this isn't a route that I want to take. And I just happened to see one of Rob's videos on YouTube, actually. And I watched it on coming home from a long day of work, sent it to my mentor. I was like, this sounds dope. Like, is this something that's achievable? And yeah, since then, I've been trying to lock in and figure out how I can get to the point where Rob, like, kind of explained his videos. And I've been going for it for the last year and a half, just trying to make it happen for my business. That's awesome. That's so Ernst and Young. Um, you, you got a CPA. Talk to me about just were you? It sounds like you were a good student growing up. Have you always been pretty studious? And, and uh, does that come naturally for you or what? Yeah, I think it's more so always a studious, but more so I was very adaptive. So one unique thing about me is uh, I've been to about 16 different schools. So at each one of those schools, I had to adapt to a new learning system and just had to adapt to a new environment, a new state. And for some reason, I always came off, you know, on top. <laughs> I always had good grades because I'm a hard worker. And uh, yeah, that's that's what kind of got me to where I'm at today. <laughs> that's fantastic. So, okay, so talk to me. So you graduated. How far between when you graduated and when you started at Ernst & Young? Because Ernst & Young, for a lot of folks, a lot of accountants, that's like the dream job, man. You want to go work at one of the big four. You want to get it going. Talk to me about like, okay, how did you get from here to, or how did you get from graduating to being at Ernst & Young? If, and tell me more about that story. I want to know more. Yeah, so I actually interned with Ernst & Young in the launch program. They were letting basically uh, sophomores and juniors kind of get an internship in a different sector. So I did audit, uh, the insurance departments, basically the same thing, tax and advisory. So I did a rotational program for two summers before even graduating from U of I, University of Illinois. And that's how I got my foot into the door at Ernst & Young. And I enjoyed it. I worked with the financial services department. Worked with a lot of wealthier kind of companies, downtown Chicago banks. And uh, yeah, I just I just felt like <laughs> I learned a lot from them. Uh, I had seen the cycle a few times because I had interned with them. And as I after I got it almost done with my first year, uh, I, I really had to take a step back and I asked myself what I wanted to do long term. And I just didn't see that route going into going into my long term goals. But that was the dream job. I was very happy and fortunate to land a big four job. But. Uh, once I sat down and thought about my long-term goals, it just didn't align with where I wanted to go. So tell me more about the undercurrents of who you are and what kind of vision you had that that crafted your long-term goals and what were those long-term goals? Yeah, so what I realized, so I studied abroad in Barcelona uh, in like 2018, and that was the first time in my life where I had got a break, right, from school. And I got mm. to sit down and actually think about my goals and during that process, I think I was a junior, I kind of realized quickly that I didn't want to be an accountant. You know, <laughs> I didn't want to have that, you know, kind of the boring accounting job sitting at a desk my entire life, like in the traditional corporate route. And I was actually about to risk it all. I was about to say, hey, no CPA exam. 
uh, no more accounting. I was going to switch paths to teach because I realized that I care more about having a direct impact on my community. So I was actually going to go teach for America uh, to put myself in a position to teach others about financial literacy. I was going to go to some of these underrepresented communities, teach about econ and finances just so we can, you know, start building wealth at a young age. So I was about to risk it all. And it was kind of too late. I was too deep in, you know, I was a junior. I already paid all this money for the accounting degree, started taking the CPA exam. Uh, so I went in for it. Uh, but then after time going with the pandemic, I just didn't, I wasn't satisfied still. Uh, yeah. So I still had that fight inside of me to teach. But then that's when I started doing research, learning about different career paths to how I can start merging my accounting, you know, finance background with also kind of a teaching kind of background. I quickly realized that entrepreneurship or just being in control of your life by being a business owner essentially put me in that position to start teaching others about that without being in the traditional classroom setting. Uh, so that's what kind of shifted me, just kind of having time to realize that I want to have an impact on others. And I didn't really see me having an impact on my community as an auditor at a big four accounting firm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I got a question for you. Um, I, I need to insert real quick, folks. Darren, you've been busting your tail as a business owner. A lot of people, I'll hear podcasts that are talking about, oh, I want to work for myself and I want to do an X and I want to do Y. And then they're off selling yeah. goofy no, and no, no harm on like MLMs or anything like that. But just so we're clear, yeah. folks, if you're listening to this, Darian kicked ass this year. <laughs> Darian is oh, executing yeah. on a ton of real business tax returns. He's been building and getting monthly retainer as an outsourced accountant where he does proactive tax planning, bookkeeping services, payroll services, an integrated thing. So this is not like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go sell some weird oils to people. And if you just shift yeah. everything into a business, you're going to be a business owner. no. Darian's a legit certified public accountant delivering excellence. And that's not just because I built his website and I want to see him win, but I've been, I've yeah. seen how he's working. So just so we're clear, um, there's a big difference there. A lot of people they get in, they want to, it's all about mindset and they want to get into entrepreneurship and they want to do business ownership, but a lot of them don't do the hard work to figure out how to actually do something hard. And Darian's learning how to do stuff hard and he's executing and getting the reps. I mean, how many reviews do you have right now from your current customers? We're, you've been hammering those, like, because I asked you to. Yeah. Yeah, reviews, I think uh, close to 76, 78. And I've only been in business for six, seven months. Uh, so been killing it. The goal is 100 within the first eight months of business. So I'm going for it. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to bring that up right away. So if anybody's listening to this, this is high protein yeah. work. This is no small bit. And just to brag on you a little bit. The second thing is, um, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, you mentioned helping and serving your community. You you mentioned you're, you grew up in Chicago. Tell me more about that, that drive to want to teach and, and your community. Tell me more about who that is, what that looks like and what you've learned. Yeah, so I got to clear this up for the Chicagoans. I am from the <laughs> south suburbs of Chicago, right? So I'm not. So it basically it's the same thing. I'm five minutes away from Chicago, but I grew up in a city called Chicago Heights, Ford Heights, Harvey. And I kid you right now, if you're watching this podcast, literally Google ten of the poorest south suburbs of Chicago, right? And out of those ten places, I said I've been to sixteen schools. I've lived in eight out of those 10 of the poorest South suburbs of Chicago. So I know what it's, I know what it's like to be not only just a minority in this country, but to grow up as somebody without money, uh, relying on the government and just having to go through all of those unfortunate circumstances. But I've also had the benefit too of traveling to 13 different countries, going to a uh, top two accounting program in the nation, you know, traveling all over the world basically. So seeing both ends of the straw is uh, motivating me to kind of go back and give back. So. Basically, I grew up in very small, kind of underrepresented, impoverished communities. Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of us use that as excuses, which are, by all means are valid excuses. But I've been trying my entire life to figure out how to use that experience, those experiences as fuel to drive me to get to the next level so I can be in a position to, to go back home and uh, be a positive role model and to start making small changes, you know, one step at a time. Yeah, that's freaking life giving, man. I love that. Um Talk to me, were there like, what are some of the hardest parts? So people will hear folks growing up in Chicago and right now it seems like crime is so high and things are seem from the outside. I'm up in Minneapolis and I'm in a suburb. Like I grew up yeah. in a suburb um, and 
it we always hear how tough and 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 difficult life can be in those circumstances and here you are a young black american who has a certified public accountant you're killing it in your job what were some of the harder parts in your path over the last 10 years to get to where you are like share share a little bit i guess i didn't ask you to come prepared to to share that kind but i'd love to hear more man yeah the past 10 years i would think the biggest challenges, right? So yeah, Chicago is dangerous, right? You hear that a lot. I also stayed on the south side of Minneapolis. Was it close to Robbinsdale, kind of Lindale, 26th Avenue in that area too. So I can kind of compare the two. But growing up in Chicago and just in the Chicagoland area, you quickly, one of the biggest challenges you face, especially as a young black man, especially if you grow up fatherless too as well, you don't come from that standard kind of home where you can learn and kind of have those positive role models in your areas to bounce ideas off. So not only do you not have positive role models within your home, right, under the same roof as you, but you also don't have positive role models in the community, right? A lot of us, especially Black America, we under the assumption that there's only a few ways to make it out, right? And this might sound cliche, but it's serious, right? Rapping, sports, or, you know, something random, right? So you don't see too many people who look like me or just business owners in general, especially my age, uh, taking this route to build that success and take it to the next level. So that's one of the biggest challenges. Yes, it's a bad areas and spots, but it's mostly like that because we don't have the role models in the community to show the young kids, the young students out there that there's other options. So that was the biggest thing, which is why I love mentors, because <laughs> I, I, I ask plenty of questions. I try to surround myself around people that's at the level that I want to be and people like Rob in my life and my other mentors, like you you change the game for young guys like me. So I really appreciate you. (laughs) That's so cool. It's funny that you bring this up because, you know, so my entrepreneurship story is, you know, I grew up, my dad and parents, I have one brother, my mom and dad are there very like we're a Christian, simple family. My dad sold Caterpillar equipment. He was a salesman selling heavy machinery to contractors in night. So I was born in 1982. My dad moved from Fargo. He grew up in a super small like town of 200 people out in the middle of nowhere. As a farmer, he went to school at NDSU, finished a construction management degree. And in 1984, um, somebody came into NDSU and was like, hey, any of you guys interested in selling tractors? And he was from Ziegler, the cat dealer here in Minneapolis. So my dad's like, I, I got two kids and we're living in a trailer park and it's simple. Like we have no money. We have nothing. Yeah, I'll go do some opportunity. And so he came down here. And it was, it, it's just interesting. So my dad came down, he was a salesperson. He eventually um, just kept at Ziegler. He retired there after 30 years and was a sales manager and whatnot. So in my bones was always like, if you know anything about selling tractors, it's it's about positioning value because Ziegler and Cat is more expensive. And that's, that's just in my bones, right? But about 11 years ago now, I, I had worked for six, seven years in retail. I actually went to Northern Illinois University for one year. I got a full ride scholarship to play football, came home, was drinking beer, being a fool and uh, quit football. I'm like, I can't, I can't drink beer, do college and play football. Like that's not going to work. And, and it was Swap just a, a, yeah, it was a foolish time in my life. And I came home and my, my mom's like, dude, you got to get a job. I'm like, I've been a three sport athlete. I, I've never worked. So I got a job at a Perkins restaurant, served tables for two years. Then I got, I, w- I was totally tired of that. I'm working overnights, 5 PM to 5 AM shifts, like serving tables to drunk people. And I'm like, eh, this is not my favorite thing. And then I applied at Best Buy and I got a job at Best Buy and I learned simple sales. But for about seven years or six years, I was at Best Buy. I had one little stint where I tried an entrepreneurial thing with a, or a couple of entrepreneurs and learned a lot. And long story short, after that, and I had sold thousands, tens of thousands of computers, and I got really good at kind of being a guide to help people choose the right computer and whatever, and tried to grow some leadership. And then all of a sudden, um, my life just started getting transformed. God had done some great things in my life, you know, at minimum, just showing me like, hey, if this stuff is sin, quit being angry, quit being a fool, quit drinking, like start, start taking ownership of what you're doing with your life. And Man, the momentum really started to build. I got asked to go work at, at our church, Eagle Brook Church, and was there for two years, did really well. Got a new supervisor, and I was not humble enough, and I was kind of proud and kind of arrogant, and I got fired. And when I got fired, I got recruited to go to Thrivent Financial, which is like 
basically run your own business, sell insurance and investments. And it's under this like Lutheran Christian thing. And I got in there. I'm like, well, this sounds cool. But and then I saw the products. I'm like, Ugh, this seems like I'm tricking people into buying crap that they should not buy. And, but in that, all of a sudden, I found that the, there was some investment advisors that position themselves as tax planners and some guys that would do estate planning. So went back to school. Finally, I hadn't finished. I'd been kind of in and out and unmotivated. and But now I was motivated, finished school, learned everything I could about tax planning. And I had put together like this idea where I was going to go out and I was going to find these self-employed guys like who my dad would sell, sell to, contractors, landscaping dudes, guys that I played football with that you know weren't great students, but had their own business now because they knew how to do stuff. And Long story short, found this opportunity to do this tax and accounting firm and all these people don't get tax planning. So I started this nuanced financial and then I shifted into Feedback Ranch about eight years ago. Um, so I have a bunch of YouTube videos that talk about how to be an accountant. That's why we're here. But in all of that, doing financial planning for a year and a half, doing taxes, one of the things that I learned, there's a point to this story. One of the things I learned was I would do these snapshots or analysis on people's finances. And you'd look in their bank accounts and you're like, okay, why, why do you have so much money? <laughs> and you ask them what they do yeah. for a living and you're like, you do what? What do you do? Oh, we brokerage this between that. And, and I started realizing that one of the, when you mention role models, the idea is you have a role model in your life that shows you what good can be. So you can model yourself after that, right? And then also when it comes to business ownership and entrepreneurship, I get super passionate. And part of why I like having guys like you on here is I want more people to understand there is a whole world of career opportunity where you can make stupid amounts of money. You got to work your butt off. Like it's totally different. It's all down to execution and sales, but people don't know it's even a thing. Like, did you, exactly. if you were to think back seven years ago, would you dream, I mean, would you dream that you'd be running your own business right now, your own firm? Or is that, I mean. No, that, that wasn't even part of the vision two years ago. <laughs> it was, it was something that was completely foreign. And you hear about entrepreneurship running your own business and it sounds like a bunch of stress, right? A lot of work, long hours, weekends. Uh, so it was never part of my agenda until I realized how many hours, it's another story, how many hours I was working for somebody else. And then it finally clicked to me. Imagine if I worked, you know, big four accounting, you know, firm hours or law firm hours and apply that to myself and my business. Not only are you going to like triple or 10 times your income, but it's going to give you control of your life. So that's what converted me over. But initially, it never was a route I thought about taking. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. So talk to me a little bit about what do you learn? What have you learned from your mentors over the last couple of years? Have there been some critical points that they've inserted in your life or vision they've casted or, or wisdom or guidance? Any really big critical things that you think is worth people hearing about or what, what, what's been most effective for you, man? Yeah, one thing I want to say about mentors, and uh, you started off saying that I'm like one of the few people, I don't know if the only, but one of the few people who kind of follow what you said step by step to get to where I'm at today. Like your advice was golden, right? And I noticed that even when you got people in our communities going out, giving advice to teach people how to get to where they're trying to go, a lot of people don't implement those things, right? So for me, I'm one of those people where if I speak to somebody that's where I want to be down the road, or somebody that I look up to and they give me advice and it's good advice, I'm going to follow it step by step. So that's one thing. I'm one of those people. I'm very observant. I ask plenty of questions and then I try to apply that, whatever I learn instantly in my life. But as far as mentors for me, been golden. My first mentor, uh, Jason, growing up, he pretty much showed me the ropes of how to make it out of my community. He grew up in similar areas. Now he has the fancy house, you know, the wife, the kids, the kind, the kind of what I want later down the road. And he taught me basically how to get there. You know, he got me into college for free by connecting me with uh, another lady who's a mentor and pretty much didn't have to pay a single penny to go to college. Got a free ride up to my PhD because of him. So especially shout wow. out to him. And then my current mentor, uh, he, he's just a goat. Uh, I can tell a little story on him. I'll never forget. He has the same background as me, right? He probably started exactly where I met. And I was listening to a podcast one day and he was just talking about, hey, I'm from the south side of Chicago. I went to the University of Illinois, but now I'm making $100,000 a month. And I was like, <laughs> hold on. 
did, did you just basically explain my upbringing? Now you're making that. Uh, so what I did was I found them on LinkedIn uh, and sent them a message like, hey, we went to the same school, same background. Like, what did you learn that I didn't learn? Like, what did I miss? I had good grades. I paid attention. I did the internships. But what did I miss? And he s sat down with me, broke it down to me. He was like, why would the lion teach his prey on how to get away? Why would these big institutions, why would these big schools teach you how to leave, you know, college to go start your own business? Or better yet, a tax firm, right? Because they need us to thrive, right? So the moment he broke that down to me and explained that everything I need to know is right here in these books, I switched my entire lifestyle. So just long story short, mm. I can go on that forever. Just seeing it's possible and having mentors in your life that's where you want to be and kind of having them guide you through the process similar to what you've done with me like it's, it's, it's golden so <laughs> dude that's cool so now you bring up something interesting i want to pick on this a little bit so here you are somebody who it sounds like college taught you a bunch right and yet you just described this day i'm pretty cynical at college i went back to school and finished up really quick um I always think that the to me, the value of college is you go in, you have to get through a program, you have to execute on time, deliver results in the right way, you have to learn how to synthesize information and reform it and, and do it really well. And yet I'm a firm believer that the accreditation system is a joke. The pricing and inflation is murderous. I think that, and then you just described, you know, from kindergarten to 12th grade to higher education, it's kind of meant to keep you in a system, it seems like, or almost yeah. like a, so tell me more about what did you, so what, what did your mentor, tell me more about what you meant there. Like, what what, what do you mean? Because I, I yeah. think I agree big time and I could probably rant way too long about it, but tell me more yeah, about what yeah. you mean. The way I look at it, right, and, and this is the truth, right? I'm a CPA. I graduated from the number two accounting program in the nation. Uh, big four accountants are, you know, mostly CPAs. And one thing I have to say is, the stuff that I do today at work, you know, for my business and to my clients, I didn't learn it in school. I mm. mean, what I didn't learn it taking the CPA exam. I learned the solid foundation to a lot of this stuff, but a lot of the applying, you know, the strategy, uh, being a business owner, you know, working on your own brand and strategy for an individual level, I didn't learn that from school. Uh, and I always ask my mentor, like, like, why didn't they teach us that? Right? We talk about financial literacy, taxes buying homes, you know, investing in stocks and all these things that you need to know as an adult. Yet we all complain that we don't get taught it, you know, <laughs> in the education system. So they're not going to rant. Uh, he basically just put emphasis on the fact as to why the school didn't teach me everything I needed to know to go off and start my own business. Because if I learned it in school, I'm pretty sure all of the smart individuals there too as well would have went off and started their own business. And now there's no big four, right? Now there's not any, you know, mid-sized accounting firms because now everyone has their own small practice and, you know, yep. that's the way to go. <laughs> yep. It's amazing. So a little bit of like, why don't you frame up a little bit? Cause I, I could do it, but I'd love to hear from you. Tell people that are listening to this. So, so maybe we've got so, some, um, some young folks like yourself, they're maybe thinking, okay, I'm 15, 16 years old. I want to figure out what I want to do. I like the idea of, I, I've been told I should go to college. I like the idea of business ownership. Very practically, you mentioned what you learn in school isn't what you do right now. Why don't you clearly tell listeners, what are you doing right now? So we all hear tax and accounting firm, but like, what's the practical services you're doing and who are you doing it for? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can answer that. But before I want to throw a little small note in there, I am a fan of college for some people. And I'm glad I went because of the experiences I got. Right. A huge reason why I was able to get my mentor and my last job is because of the network I was able to establish at a big institution and the opportunity to study abroad. That's golden. Right. So if you're in a position to you know afford it and they take that route to get that experience, I say go for it. But you do not need fancy college degree to start your own business. I just wanted to put that out there. But Absolutely. to answer, so what do I do, right? So I worked originally at a big four accounting as an auditor working with large institutions. You know, I was like the, the bottom guy in the group, right? You start off in the trenches, basically. But now what I do is I work with individual business owners, right? I work with the smaller guys. I work with the consultant firms in the areas, the service-based businesses, the construction companies with three to five employees. And instead of just traditionally, you know, taking a route of H&R Block 
and just filing taxes, I proactively work with business owners and I sit down with them throughout the year. Right. So it's not just you come to me during tax time, say, hey, here's my numbers. Here's my profit and loss statement for all my taxes. I can do that. But what I do for my core clients is I meet with them monthly or I meet with them quarterly. And now we actually strategically plan. We tax plan, right? We figure out strategies that they can implement throughout the year to help them save money, not only this tax year, but every year moving forward. And on top of that, we offer bookkeeping, payroll, and tax prep as well with the thought of helping small business owners stress less about finances so they can focus more on their business and growing their brand. So we work with the smaller guys. It's a more proactive, hands-on approach, uh, just understanding that not too many people Basically, finances can be stressful, not only for you as an individual with a W-2 job, but also for business owners. So now you got to qualify, you know, certified public accountant who loves doing this, who enjoys working with small businesses. And you say, hey, Darion, you know, Wig CPA, take over my books, take over my payroll, take over my tax prep planning. And I'm helping them throughout the process. So they outsourcing all of that to me. So that's in a nutshell. That's kind of what I do. Yeah, it's interesting, folks. If you're ever listening to this, there's a huge market for in small business, you know, if you think about it, if I was a, a masonry contractor, I probably got, you know, three or four folks that come in and help me do masonry and put stone up on walls or maybe fix fireplaces or whatever that is. I probably have one person back at the, the shop kind of helping me. And maybe there's one other runner that you have, but you have some labor, you have some help. And what folks don't understand is a small business of, you know, two to 15 employees somewhere in there can do some significant work. And there's a ton of them. Entropy itself, meaning that things break or need to be built, means that there are contractors, you know, I, I said masonry, concrete contractors, landscaping contractors, HVAC, you've got plumbers, you've got folks that build pools and service pools. You've got there are so many industries out there making our world hum. And when you get into it, what people don't understand is that if you get the right people teamed up in your business. One plus one, one person with and another person, it doesn't equal two. There's this multiplicative like uh, momentum that will grow. One plus one, if they're collaboratively or, or kind of cooperatively gifted, they're not necessarily the same type of person, they'll be able to execute on way more together. So that's part, like in my business, I surround myself with people that are very unlike me because I know that if I can shore up my weaknesses and find people that have strength in my weaknesses, they're going to do it at a 10 where I would maybe do it for a two. And, and what I've found is that business owners usually are are pretty decent at sales and execution and doing what they need. But this sitting down, reconciling all the books each month, making sure that they're abiding by tax law, setting up and running their payroll, checking out their finances, and then making sure that you're doing good strategic planning with your finances, it's a different muscle. So what's cool is that Darion can come alongside and kind of serve as a chief financial officer and provide some leadership and guidance. But also there are simple, they're not tricks, but they're simple strategies that if you implement and maximize an escort, for instance, if you set up you know, a retirement plan with a, an actual small business retirement plan, or if you hire your kids, or if you get involved with real estate and start shifting and maybe pay your business over to the real estate as rent, you can do dramatic reductions in taxes. And what's really cool is is what guys like Darian can do is come in and genuinely offset their the the charge that they have to be your bookkeeper and accountant and guide with tax savings. And then over the long haul, people don't understand that you really have to be wise about taxes because it will come back to bite you. But uh, you know, as people are listening, as part of why I wanted to ask of what are you doing is because you do tax returns, you help do bookkeeping, which means going into a QuickBooks or a zero and making sure that things are reconciled correctly. You help them set up their payroll. You make sure that they know how to run it. You make sure that their taxes get done at the end of the year. So you're doing corporate tax returns, business or, or, or uh, individual tax returns. And then you're providing leadership throughout the year because, and I'll just add this, the real tax planning that occurs for a small business owner, sure you do the S Corp, sure we hire and there's these little strategies, but you know what really happens? It's like, okay, I have a landscaping company and I have this old junky skid steer and I know I'm doing, you know, maybe 500,000 this year and I want to get to 800 next year. 
and I'm sitting here and I've got profit in my business this year that I'll have to pay tax on if I do it. So do I do I pay a 20% tax on my profit sitting in my bank account or do I buy a new truck and hire two new people which will lower my taxable income and then help me play offense next year? So that whole planning for growth thing is something that Darion does a really good job with and it's it's a muscle that most business owners may have a little bit, but they usually don't have it. And then if they do have it, it's right. just, it, it's a push and pull. It's hard. Like it's hard to be like doing sales, executing, building, and then like, okay, hold on. Let me go sit down for three hours and screw around in my account. When you can do that at a 10. So if you're listening to this, folks, wigcpa.com, he will help you and do some, some any thoughts or reactions or questions pop up um, as, I, as I mentioned that, Darion? Yeah, my biggest thought was, well, originally I was thinking like a lot of people don't understand the value of the services I'm starting to realize because a lot of people want to make a lot of money, right? You want to make, you know, six figure business, 500K, you know, a million dollar business, right? But then you forget that in order to get to that level, you need to understand the numbers of your business. Yes, you're bringing in $100,000 a year, but if you don't have bookkeeping, right, if you don't have the proper accounting systems in place, your business can actually be operating at a loss because you, you're not keeping track of your expenses. So I go in and I help bring the numbers to life. I help uh, taxpayers, small businesses understand their financials so they can scale and grow their business a lot faster. So, yeah, I understand yeah. 100%. <laughs> That's yeah, there's a funny thing. I just did some super rough and dirty math. When I when I started Nuance Financial Tax and Accounting, my old tax firm, um, which I shifted out because my business partners and I had some whatever, Um I, when you get into a business and you start talking to, and I always talk about construction businesses or home service, I get a ton of remodeling contractors, whatever it is. What you find is that all of these businesses have what I call Patty Part-Timer. And Patty Part-Timer is an employee that usually, you know, maybe she works full-time, maybe he works one hour or one day a week. And they come in and they usually help keep the bookkeeping up. Maybe make sure that the invoices are done right. Maybe send a reminder to some invoices because usually the business owner knows how to get paid. They'll send out an invoice. They'll usually like screw it all up or whatever. But if you just do the math on these patty part-timers, so if you're a business owner, Darion can help you between $500 and $2,500 a month. And genuinely, him and the, his team can serve as your bookkeeper. They can help make sure your AP and AR is just dialed in correctly, provide tax planning, do your tax returns, and then help make sure that payroll and everything's integrated. You'll help them save taxes. But what you find is that you are so efficient by doing all that. When you do the bookkeeping, you can do the tax planning. When you do the tax planning, then you can help them pay in their taxes so that at the end of the year, they don't have a big bomb like, oh my gosh, I forgot to pay in enough or I overpaid and I'm getting this giant return. And then because you've done all that, the tax returns are actually pretty easy at the end of the year. So not only do you have that efficiency, but if you do the math, if you have, maybe I always tell business owners, so I, I have a full-time accountant. It's not Darion. It's somebody who does just like what he does. It's Shamal. Um, I help a lot of accountants, so I'm always talking to him. But um, the, the idea here is that if you can save me eight hours a week, that's 32 hours a month at $25 an hour, you will save at least $800 a month in just simple, straight, basic labor. But if I apply that to what I'm really worth, for every, I mean, I, I have to charge 500-ish an hour the way I look at things because of where my business is. We got a team of seven around me and I either need to be leading and deploying my team, selling or creating content that, that drives more sales. So all I'm sharing here, folks, is that accountants often struggle to convey the value that they add. But what I've found is that, uh, you know, $1,500 a month for me to hire a Darion is way better than me bringing in a staff person who I don't know how to lead, I don't know how to hold accountable. They're probably nice and they'll help me in other areas. But what usually happens is at the end of the year, Darian's got to clean up all the mess she made anyways, or he made, because they do it okay. It's usually not done very well. And then you get in there and you're like, oh, because we're now reactive and looking at your tax returns right before the end of the year, even if you do that, um, they miss tax planning opportunities. You miss these strategic choices. Good tax planning has to be done ahead of time. It has to be done throughout the year and it's investing properly and doing the right thing. So um, if you're listening to this, there are so many opportunities to improve your business, become more scalable, 
and more profitable when you have an accountant and then eventually an attorney. And then I think like a strategic growth guy like me that does, you know, marketing and whatnot. Um, those are usually roles that are good to hire out, but I will, I will stop talking about yeah. that because I, I believe deeply <laughs> no, in it, but yeah, I was going to say one thing I add to that, and I'm a business owner too, right? At the end of the day, and I'm learning too uh, the advantages of hiring, outsourcing other businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, you, for instance, Rob, you can do your own taxes, you can do your own bookkeeping, right? You, you know how to do those things, but you got to realize as a business owner, you need to niche down too, as well, right? And I'm a true believer that our most valuable asset, especially as a young man, is my time, right? So if yep. I can, you know, free up my time by spending a little money to invest in someone else who already has those systems and processes already set up to help me scale and grow my business on a personal level, I, I, I'll invest that money any day of the week. So it's the same thing I tell my clients, like, hey, look at look at this as an investment, right? You're not just giving $500, $600 a month away to some. No, you're investing in your businesses in your business, sorry about that, and you're investing in your brand. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> kind it's of always, the, the work does it all. <laughs> so I got a, something that just, I get one little comment on that and then an, a question about spending time. Um, so one last little comment. If you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner, if you're an accountant and you're hearing this, you know, Darian, you, what is this? This is your like your second year doing this? Or how, uh, yeah, when did you start your business? October, October okay. 2022. So about six, seven months of full time on my own, but I spent the uh, one year at a smaller tax firm kind of learning, which we can talk yep. about whenever you're ready. One, one of the things that happens when you're, when you're starting your own, you know, B2B service-based business, it would be if I was a digital marketer and I was coming at this too, um, there are people think cost, they think price is so important. And a lot of times what'll happen is when you're, when you're presenting to folks, hey, here's a solution I have for you, and it gets to this price thing, and they're like, oh, that feels expensive, and a couple of encouragements I have for you. First off, it's very important that you get enough front-end activity outside of your immediate circles so that you can tap into all of the people you don't know about that have bigger checkbooks than what you're used to selling to. I was always blown away when I first started Nuance. Like you, you have a tendency when you first start a business to shop out of your own pocket. And when you shop out of your own pocket, you consider, well, I wouldn't pay 500 a month. That's expensive. Well, now you fast forward eight years and I have four kids and I have a business. I've started two businesses and we're gonna we're gonna try and hit our first million dollar mark this year. We're, we're on our pace to well exceed that. But my time's so valuable. Like, I don't want to screw around in anything. It's all about productivity. It's all about efficiency. It's all about value and then getting more clients and execution. In the beginning, it's not that. So you shop out of your own pocketbook. So then you have this tendency to not even deeply believe in your bones that you're worth it because you're like, well, I wouldn't buy it. Well, you're not selling to you. So knock it off. Second of all, if you don't get enough front end activity, meaning you don't talk to enough people, you're not going to find that it's one in two, you know, maybe maybe two in a hundred or one in a hundred are going to be that person that would gladly pay you $2,500 a month. What's hard though, is you have to you have to sell or swing the bat. It's just like baseball, I think. In fact, I think the hitting percentage is similar. If you can hit a 250 to 350%, percent, what you're going to find is that that's about the percentage of clients that are going to be excellent, value-focused clients that really connect with you. And, and, and so you have to talk to enough people, which means you have to create videos. You got to turn on Google ads. You got to make phone calls. You got to network. And you got to kind of shoot for these diamond-esque clients that exist. But you, if you're not going after them, you're never going to get there. And what's hard is when that's a land that you haven't been to and you're like, I don't know anything about this group. I don't, I've never sold to these. You still got to shoot at them. You still got to go there. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is, is that what's cool about the accounting business is that no matter what, people are doing this already. You're not selling, and I always get critical. I just had a friend reach out and he's like, hey, I see that you're a health conscious person that also appreciates natural remedies. And I'm like, no, I'm not. What are you talking about? And they're like, well, have you ever heard of Melaleuca or something? I'm like, stop it. Like, stop it. Go away. I'm not going to buy your 
potions. It's okay if you sell potions, but I'm not buying no potions. And I told him, look, dude, I'll pay you a 10% commission if you bring me a sale. Go make me money. I'll make you way more than you're going to make out of your, your thing. Anyways, my point is, is that people have to do a tax return. They have to do bookkeeping. They have to do payroll. They have to do these things. So what's cool is when you, when you realize that and then you also realize you're going to get a whole bunch of these people where you add a ton of value. You find out, oh, you're not an S-corp. Like we found a gal, she was a pool company. She had been a standard Schedule C for 30 years with her and her husband. Her and her husband, too. And they made a lot of money. I'm talking overpaid between twenty dollars and $50,000 a year for 30 years in tax. All because they, they had a good, consistent accountant. But he was, he was just, he only knew what he knew. And so yep. I guess what I'm getting at is once you get a couple of these under your belt, man, it's like, oh, I'm going to save this person 7000 a year. Oh my gosh, I'm going to be able to help them grow their business. And it just gets motivating. But so get enough front end activity, make sure you don't shop out of your own pocketbook. And then just remember like at minimum face rejection because they got to do it anyways. And I know you already do this, but um, I just wanted to add that. Any yeah, thoughts or what of, comes to mind of, for you? Yeah, it's part of the process. And I hope I don't lose my chain of thought. The first one to elaborate on that is you have to be in the right rooms, right? Now that tax season is over, I'm not like, you know, reaching out, you know, via email or text anymore. Like I'm going to networking events, right? I'm getting out there in the community, going to different events, going to different conferences. Like you need to be in the right rooms in order to not only grow your brand, but just to get that exposure too as well. So that's one. Networking is definitely something that's tremendous. And uh, we could talk about the website, but having a website is just key right there. Having that uh, social media appearance with the website, the videos, and just showing that you're an expert in your field, that's huge because that's going to be an asset to you when you're in the right rooms. And the last one, I knew I was going to lose my chain of thought. But definitely <laughs> uh, what I was going to say is uh, the way it works is, and I always tell my clients, is the biggest tax that we all pay is the tax of not knowing, right? So if you don't know about a tax deduction, and definitely if you're with an accountant who isn't up to date with everything that's going on, then you're losing out on money every single day because there's so many tax strategies out there and they change every time there's a new president, you know, a new law passed. So you need somebody in your corner who's up to date with everything because because paying taxes outside of the mortgage and, you know, probably getting married, not married yet, but uh, it's going to be one of your biggest expenses throughout your lifetime. So it's, it's, it's always a good asset to have a, a certified professional in your corner for that reason. I got a question for you. So, okay, just to clarify, mm -hmm. you're on the younger, you're younger than I am, right? Um, you yeah, said, <laughs> and I like this, I don't want to make an assumption about people. You're under 30, right? Yeah, way under 30. I just graduated Wait. from school three years ago. <laughs> okay, okay. So how old are you, if you mind me asking? Just turned 26. Just turned 26, okay. You made a statement that the thing that is most valuable to you is your time and how you spend your time is super important. Most, when I was 26, I think I might have kind of known that, but I didn't apply it. So here you are, in my opinion, applying it. What are some things that a typical 26-year-old spends their time doing that you do less of so that you can get to where you are? I mean, I have I could go on a big old rant here. Um, yeah. but what are some things that you notice as an encouragement? And part of this is, as you said, role models matter. And I would tell a lot of dudes, just so you know, quit playing video games all the time. Don't drink, don't party, go get some skills, go get a side gig and sell, go do something. As soon as I quit doing, and it was leisure for me. I'll just, I'll shut up with this. For me, it was leisure. Yeah. Oh, I just want to go home, put my feet. I don't drink a drop anymore because I like to drink. And I was like, oh, this is not helpful for me. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm a big advocate. And I've seen, just so you know, I have a lot of friends who would compromise in that and just little bits. And I've seen, now that I'm 42, my friends are dying. Like they're addicted. They get cancers. They get in car accidents because over 30 years, over 25 years, you do foolish things, the foolish mark will fall on you. That's not a threat and that's not, a, I don't want to overdo that. Yeah. But but when you compromise on drugs, I have a friend who he, he liked to kick back and get some pills every once in a while. He got the wrong pill. He's dead. It just makes me sick. Mm. And it, it eventually hit him. It took him 22 years of enjoying a little bit of pill here and there. He's dead. 
and his family's devastated. I got a bunch of friends that have gone through and they compromise on drinking. And all of a sudden they can't stay married because they are addicted and they didn't try to. I have friends that, I know gals that are just, that they hide their alcoholism. There's so many, so, but besides that, I, I think that's a bigger deal than what most people, it's okay if you don't either, or if you don't think it's that big yeah. of a deal, but I think that it's a momentum killer. So I, want, I wanted to give two or three ideas here. I think people should stop drinking, stop smoking weed, and stop playing as many video games. Go get a skill, make some money. Get in a position where you can buy a boat. You can do whatever you want if you take your leisure time and compoundingly invest that into side gigs, business, ability to grow. Um, and I love games. I grew up, like, I, I was a Nintendo guy. I just saw the Mario movie. Like, I grew up, I had a Super Nintendo. Like, I totally get I still, I would probably sit down and play games. But I also know that, like, to me, my business is my game. Like my business is like a role playing Maybe. game to me. Like, dude, it's like playing World of Warcraft back in the day. Like every time I'm going in, I'm writing blogs. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm I'm raising my intellect. Like it's like it's goofy for me. And so my encouragement is, if you want to build momentum, there are things I think you should stop doing, start doing, and maybe grow. But what things come to mind that you, as a 26 year old? Not that you're perfect and not that I'm perfect, but what are some things that you would speak to other 26 year, maybe the 16 year old to know what are the types of things you got to start, stop or grow to get to where you're trying to get to? Okay. My turn to go on the rant. Well, first, sorry to hear all that, by the way, that's, that's <laughs> a lot. Uh, and this isn't one of my things in my top three, but drinking is definitely one of those things where as a business owner now, right. And I, I'm old enough to drink, so I have drinks. I hate drinking now. I still do it, but I hate it because I love working on weekends. As bad as it sounds, tomorrow I'm excited to get up and knock out three, four hours of work, undistracted, actually take care of some administrative stuff. But if you got a hangover from the night before, like, it's going to be really hard to recover. Uh, so that's one thing I'm learning, too, as a young man. I know in order for me to reach that new version of myself that I want to be, down the road, that's going to be one of the things I sadly got to cut out. So that, that's that's to comment on what you said. But number one, and this is one that I'm learning, this won't be in order, is social media, right? And this is speaking to mm -hmm. the younger folks up until my age. I am 26. I made my first Instagram and my first Twitter eight months ago when I turned 25. I went my entire life, based, I had a Facebook for family friends, but I went my entire life off these flashy social media platforms because I was so locked in on my dreams and my goals that I didn't care about what anybody else around me was doing. Yes, I missed out on a lot of stuff and all like conversations within friend groups, but I wanted to limit the distractions. So it, if it ain't social media, whatever it is, it's your biggest feed of distractions, whether it's that group chat or, you know, you know, that social media platform that you're on every single day watching videos, maybe take a break and find some way to do some self-discipline. The reason why I made it is because I needed to work on my brand and to have a business now, right? So that's why I'm on social media now. But prior to that, in those years where you're trying to develop and figure out who you are, it's best to have as many, the least amount of voices in your head distracting you as possible. So that's number one, social media. The other one was video games. I love video games too. I just never was really in it. You know, I'm a Madden person. Uh, mm. And I stopped playing those for a decent percentage of time, especially during college. Like, I was so locked in. I had a full ride. I'm a Gates Millennium Scholar. So I basically had a full ride up to my PhD. And I'd be damned if I would have went to school and risked that all because of drinking and video games and social media. So that's one thing, kind of limited those things. I try to play it now here and there because I realize you need those distractions. So it, I try to play every once in a while, but definitely don't spend all of your time doing it. Or if you are playing it, right, throw on the podcast, throw on, mm. throw on the audio book in the background. Still figure out a way to educate yourself at the same time. And then the last one, and this is the most important one that a lot of folks our age miss out. Uh, one of my best friends told me out of school, and I didn't know what he meant when we graduated with our master's. He was like, never stop learning. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's fine. I'll pick up a book once a year, right? But the moment I learned the key to learning, better yet, one thing that a lot of people our age don't do is the key to investing in yourself. That That's the biggest thing right there. You, we need to figure out a way to continue to invest in yourself. When I knew I was leaving Big Four Accounting to start my own business, or when that thought even came in my head, I changed my entire lifestyle, right? I invested in a mentor. I invested in a morning routine. I invested in reading books 
podcast. I enrolled at Commute University. So every time I was in a car, every time I was home alone cooking, I was listening to a podcast. I was listening to a book. Like I got addicted to investing all of that time and energy to myself. Because if you just think about it from this perspective, all our life we've been in school, right? Learning stuff that probably didn't need to learn. You know, it's up to you, kind of your call. And then you work these jobs. And I mentioned it earlier, you work these jobs, you're giving them 40, 50, 60. And as a CPA or even a lawyer, 70, 80 hours a week of your time to somebody else, right? So when I started investing in myself, I told myself, imagine if you apply that same amount of time or even a small fraction of that time to investing in your dreams and goals. That's what helped me get to the next level. So I say invest in yourself. You can play the games. You can be on social media. That's fine, right? But if you're not using it in an appropriate way to invest in yourself to help you get to the next level, you're slowing down the process. The faster you invest in yourself, the faster you scale and grow your business, the faster you start making the amount of money you want is the faster you'll be able to dream, uh, the fastest the fastest way to be able to live your dream life. And I'm a true believer in investing in yourself to get there. So that, that's probably my biggest three keys. <laughs> that is wise. That is very wise. You're very, you're much wiser beyond your years, man. You mentioned books. I saw you hold up Think and Grow Rich. Are there some, what are some books that have been impactful in your life? Um, what are some things you've learned? Any bigger aha moments? Anything stand out as some books you know that have been really, really helpful for you? But sh share some of the things that have been most impactful for you, if you can think of some. Yeah, I go through a book and funny story. So uh, when I was in high school, I wrestled at 106 pounds, right? I was the, one of the tallest kids on, this, on the team, <laughs> but one of the smallest kids on the team, right? And I was weak. Like, I wasn't as strong as I wanted to be. I was good because I was, like, long by all means, my arms. But the moment I started doing push-ups, I developed a chest, I developed muscles, and I got to the next level. And I say that because I hated push-ups. So the moment I started doing something that I hated but I needed to do, it got me to the next level. And it's the same thing with reading. I didn't like reading. I don't, who wants to sit down, you know, 21, 22, and read a book on a weekend or at night before going to sleep? I hated reading. But the moment I discovered the value of what's inside of these books, it was life changing, right? So I started reading my goal this year, and I don't know if I'm going to reach it. Well, I'm going to reach it. I want to speak it into existence. I want to read 30 books this year. I went from one book, two book, five book, 16 books, and I'm shooting for 30. Uh, but yeah, so I basically right now, I spent the first couple months of this year reading about books to help my mindset, help me get to the next level. But the first book that I read, and I hear all the time when you hop on podcasts and videos and hear, what's the first book you read? For me, it was definitely Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, mm. Fell in love with that book. It was definitely one of those books that kind of helped me change my mindset and my perspective on things. And after that, some of my favorite books uh, is The Morning Routine. I definitely just read that a couple of days ago. That kind of got me in the habit of waking up early and just kind of working on myself attentively in the morning. Uh, the Go-Giver. Uh, is teaching you how to give value to your customers, right? That and uh, to go for no, basically. Uh, it's teaching you how to give as much value as possible to your customers and the people around you. And then, what is it? The richest man in, uh, richest man in Babylon? Babylon, what is it called? yeah. <laughs> I yeah, that's yeah. What it is. Yep, I read that last year, and, and that was a good book, too. Basically, I try to read books that's going to help me not only strengthen my mindset, but also help me involve into the person I need to become to reach the level that I want to. And I understand fully that it's going to, in order to get to that next version of myself, I'm going to have to lose the current version of myself uh, to become that next person. And books play a huge role. I post on my Instagram every time I read a new book. And by the end of this year, I'm hoping to have an inventory of somewhere between 30 and 40 of book recommendations uh, and some things that I learned from them just to help other people. So yeah, love reading that's, now. That's fantastic, man. I'm, I'm again, this is life giving to hear. It's it's encouraging to me. Um, there's you know there's I want to share one book as I think about this. This was no setup for me to be like. Let me tell you the book. There's a book called Leadership and Self Deception. Leadership and Self Deception, and in it, it's kind of this story. And this one, so my company is called Feedback Wrench, and the reason why it was that is because um, I mean I'm a big brother, so I have one little brother. I was captain of the football team, captain of the track team. I'm a strong personality. Like I, I have like, I like to be player one. <laughs> like 
I have all the all the failings of a of a firstborn. Um, and I grew up with, you know, my brother's a second born, my mom's a second born, my dad's a middle child. So I was the other, right. I was joking, like uh, ganged up on me all the time. But, um, you know, I usually have an idea of how I want things to be done. And I, I have a dark side, like there's a strength in that, but there's this other dark side that's there. And one of the most valuable things that I learned, it was when I worked at Eagle Brook church, um, we did a couple of things. So one of them was you want to learn about your strength. And then you start learning that with every strength you have, there's usually like a shadow to it. There's usually like, you'll have a propensity to struggle with different things. And I did a couple of exercises. One of them was this EQ 360 analysis. And this sucker was brutal. Um, so long story short, right around the time I got fired. <laughs> um, I did this twice. So one time I did it because it was just leadership development. And one time I did it because I needed a little rearranging. And basically what we did is we took 30 people who know us. So people you work with, your family members, and they sent them an anonymous survey, totally anonymous. And it asked them a series of questions. So the first one is like, what's it like to be around Rob when he's at his best? And then it's, what's it like to be around Rob when he's at his worst? And then the next one is, what do Rob's biggest critics say about him, even if you don't agree? Which is permission to gossip about everything bad you've ever heard about Rob. Now, the question is, is do I want to hear that? It's kind of like, I got food on my face because... To a degree, other people's perception of us does not define us, but in another sense, it can. And so the idea is, is that by gaining feedback, now you got to be healthy for this. So again, like I meant, I don't want to, I'm mentally healthy. I got my sin. I've got my dark sides. Like I got my struggles, right? But like my identity is in God. My identity is in Christ. My identity is, is in being a son and a dad and a what Like I was in a good place when I did this. If you're struggling with that stuff, I can understand why you will. This might not be the best exercise right away. But the idea is, is there's these sides of us that we should become aware of because if we don't know that there's food on our face, how are we ever going to like get at it? And then, and then the other thing is, is do we really want to know? Like, do, do you want to know the stuff that they really say? So we did this with like 30 and I got that feedback. And the first time it was like, okay, yeah, I can help on this. And then the second time it was like, it was just much deeper because not only do they ask, what do Rob's biggest critics say about him? Even if you don't agree, then they have you go through each, and there's more categories, each version of that category and give on a scale of one to five, five being fully convinced one being not, how convinced are you that Rob can and will change when confronted with this? Which is just how big of a butthead is Rob? Is he going to be able to push through this or not? Is he going to be humble enough to receive this feedback and adapt and integrate that into his heart and in his character and who he is? And I was like, it was game changing in my life. And to this day, like I, I'm at least much more aware of how I ding people. The other thing is, so this, so that's not this leadership and self-deception. If anything, that's after, there's a book by Henry Cloud called Integrity. And, and so all of these things are kind of based off of this idea. You go through life and you leave a wake behind you. A wake like a boat going through water. And there's two parts to your wake. How you get things done and how you leave people. How you relate to people. So like, do you execute on time and with excellence? And do you get your homework done? And are you reliable on your work? And then are you are you loving and great to work with? Are you enjoyable or are you a pain, right? And those are kind of like the two major handles. So there's lots of coaching around that in, in this book, Integrity, that I think is helpful. But I'll end with this, man. I, I don't want to keep going. But this leadership and self-deception, there's this little parable they tell in here. And once you have a baby, you will understand this parable. So the whole idea of this book, of this leadership and self-deception, is that all of us tell ourselves, we deceive ourselves to support positions and thoughts that we have, right? So I might act... I might have this dark side in my character or a flaw, but I deceive myself about, well, I'm this way because I don't have a dad. I'm this way because I'm a, like, people just don't understand me. They don't like me because of my reputation or like we build up excuses 
or we deceive ourselves into thinking. So this book equips you to start catching yourself doing that. And, and the example in the parable they use is, and this is real, when you have a baby, by the way, a baby needs to be fed every two and a half hours when it's first born. So that means you and your wife lay down and you're going to bed and all of a sudden you hear a baby cry. And here's what happens. I lay there and I'm working and she's home because she's on maternity leave and I'm sitting there and I hear, I have a choice. What's the big boy thing to do? Get up and go feed that baby. Go get up, get the baby, hand it to your wife. Here you go, sunshine. Can I get you a cup of water? But you know what you don't want to do on day 90 of that <laughs> is do that. You don't want to do that at all. You want to, you want to lay down. So the idea is think of the lies you start telling yourself. You know what? She's got maternity leave. She should get up and do this. I'm just going to lay here. She'll get up. So you sit there and you wait and you wait. And the baby's cries get louder and louder and louder. I was sitting like, God, she's totally awake. She could totally go over there while I'm awake. But this is totally what you do. You're like, why doesn't she get her tail up and go get it? God, you know, and, and so the idea is eventually you, you build this thing like, you know what? I have to go to work tomorrow. I wish she'd get up and get that baby. Oh, you know what? Gosh, she's lazy. Why doesn't she just get up? And you think of like these thoughts that could enter into your brain. That's all self-deception that we have a tendency to tell ourselves that ultimately, is it helpful for my wife? No. Is it helpful for the baby? No. Does it make me into the man that would have excellent character and be noble? Nope. Like it's all lose, 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 but there's this, there's a better way. So anyways, it's just a really great book. I highly recommend Leadership and Self-Deception. It's by the Arbinger Institute, but I didn't, I didn't try and ask you what books you like so I could tell this. It was just that came to mind while you no, were saying No, no, that's perfect. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm at least listening to the audio book because <laughs> I've noticed <laughs> yes. that too. And one common trend, because I spent, basically I broke down the year into four seasons, four quarters, right? I love sports, so I try to break everything down. And the first four months of the year were mindset books, you know, first three, four months, strictly mindset. And the common thing is just watching the thoughts is coming in, in and out of your head, you know, it becomes your reality. So uh, I've, been, I've been very selective after reading books about who I surround myself around and also the things that I allow myself to hear. Uh, just so I keep speaking, you know, positive affirmations to myself and my environment. So no, I, cool. I'll check that book out. <laughs> there are two things I really want to ask you. And one of them, so as I'm listening to you, if I think of, I bet there's a bunch, there, there's a bunch of 12 year old little boys, maybe on the South side of Chicago listening to this. They're like, that's encouraging, but you're like a freak of nature. What do you mean you like to wait? Like my life sucks. I'm not going to do all the stuff you just said, Darian. Like, you, it sounds like you got it pretty easy. What encouragement do you have to maybe somebody that had it harder than you, that maybe is in a similar position, of, of how do you get to a point where you're the type of person that wants to read books, wants to get their CPA, wants to do all this? Like, What practical advice do you have? I think you mentioned a little bit with your mentorship, but there's this side of me that like, I, I see you, man, and, and you're doing the right stuff, and I think that's encouraging. But there's so many people that can feel so far from that. They've made mistakes. They're not doing this stuff. And maybe they're in a place where, like, everything's working against them, and they're hearing your stuff, and that, that doesn't sound like reality to them. What, what, what hope do you have for them? What encouragement? What tips? What advice? Like, just what else do you have, man? Yeah, that is the million dollar question, right? I sit down with family and friends and it can be in the middle of the night and I ask them, like, what can we do? What can I do to encourage young folks, uh, who, people who are going through the same thing to kind of take that level to seriously invest in themselves? And I honestly, I have not figured out the answer because the way I look at it is, right? You see a guy like me, you know, I'm doing very good. I'm successful, right? But I'm not flashy, right? I can come, he's not the numbers yet, but I can come off for 30, 40, $50,000 a month. And I'm still driving my same 2000 Toyota Avalon. I don't care about name brand clothes and Jordans and shoes and fancy. I'm not that type of person, right? I'm a humble guy and I never had those things and I don't want it now, right? So that's one thing I battle. I'm like, how can I get myself in a position 
to show, you know, basically what a lot of young folks want is they want money, right? They want a successful life. They want the house. They want they want everything. And the moment I figure out how to give them advice to help them get to that level, I will. But to answer your question, right? The one advice I would give to them right now, you said the 12-year-old or someone that's going through it right now, is number one, just believe in yourself, right? You got to believe in yourself and believe that God wouldn't put you in this position if it wasn't a way out, right? So to truly kind of tap in, and I, I really believe, I always tell friends and family, you need a mentor. Like, I'll, I'll go to that every day of the week, but you need, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And the problem is our communities don't get enough exposure to see it. So, yeah, I, I yeah, you got to You got to believe like in yourself. Put yourself in a position uh, where you start surrounding yourself around people. That's where you want to be and go all in on your dreams and goals. Stop. Stop waiting for the opportunity to fall in your lap. Go create that opportunity. And the earlier you start, the better off you'll be in the long run. But it has to start within. So just believe in yourself. Uh, believe that there's brighter days on the other side and yeah go all in that's, that's all i can say <laughs> and once that's i get good. in a position to kind of go in those communities one part i want to do is i do want to do a lot of public speaking partner with some schools i'm a treasurer of two nonprofits. uh one to go to baton group where we're working with leaders and helping them you know teach them how to work on their brand and their image but most importantly teach them how to heal themselves right how to grow their businesses and scales and another one scholar shop mom I want to give scholarships out to the communities because we talked about college in the beginning about, yeah, that's that's not like the go to route for everybody. But I feel like you come from my area and the streets that I was raised in, in a way, you kind of need to get out of that environment to grow. So if it's a way that I can dump resources back into my community through scholarships and other programs to help these kids get exposure so they can be around, you know, some of their wealthier friends when they get to college, right? Uh, to see what's on the other side, I think that'll help. So yeah, yeah. Um, does that kind of answer your question? I, I love it. I love it. It's always funny because I think one of the things that's happening in society right now is it's like, Nobody's allowed to, like, everybody's giving advice. Everybody's kind of flexing on it. Or there's a lot of flexing going on. You know, it's kind of funny. I When, you, when you're when you an accountant, you probably see it. So I had an accounting firm. I used to do investments. And then I see business side. And I kind of, like, when you start seeing the P&Ls, you start seeing how people act. Um, a lot of people have way more payments yeah. than they have cash. And that's just dumb. And there's a lot of people that become slaves to the short term gratification stuff that really robs you. Um, you know, the things, so I didn't ask you that question so I could give, here's my advice. Part of what I yeah. get really encouraged by is that I, I really believe that what you said about mentorship, I always tell people when they're going to start a business, one of the things I say, if you don't have any sales and you don't know what to do, go find an entrepreneur, call them, grab a sheet of paper, get a pen and go ask questions and take notes and don't be a butthead. Like, go, go sponge off of them. Hey, I got a question for you. I'm dreaming of starting my own landscaping business. I'm dreaming of starting my own accounting business. What advice would you have for me? And then it's like this. You don't sit there and try and get them as a client. You don't sit there and try and tell them how smart you are. You don't worry about how smart you are. You, you listen. You grow, you get from them. Like, just listen. You can even do it in a quick phone, but hey, man, I got a question for you. Could you, I just, could I call you and get an hour of your time to hear what it's been like for you as a business owner? What advice would you have for your former self? What advice would you have for me? What advice would you have? That's one little encouragement. Go get around those people. The, the, the side part to that is go get a job. Now, you mentioned you worked at Ernst & Young. You worked in a small accounting firm, I think you said. Um, but you got some experience. You know, I worked at Best Buy. Best Buy taught me. I think I learned more at Best Buy and Perkins than I did from college. And that was like super simple stuff. But I learned how to serve people. And at serving food, I learned how to like engage with each person at just the right level. So that some people want like, hey, be my happy guy. And some people just want you to keep the water full. And then when I was at Best Buy, I learned, well, I got to hit our numbers. I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to be slimy. And yet we got to sell some warranties and yet we got to push, you know, we got to move product, right? But I learned how to be a guide. And then I learned so much more after that, but it was all self-driven, same way. Like everything I do right now, I didn't yeah. know how to do websites 10 years ago. I didn't know how to do any of this. Now I'm the highest rated 
web design company in Minneapolis. We probably do more websites than anybody else in Minneapolis. I didn't know how to do any of this. I didn't, I was a bad, I hated English teachers. I hated them. I was like, leave me alone. I don't care about this. I do, 90% of what I do is write now. Like, that's what I do. I get paid to write. Are you kidding me? Like, so I get around people, but go get a job. So here's, I did want to add this little thing here. The richest people I know around me, they do construction and all of them have the same path. You go get a job in a construction business. Okay. You learn the trade. And when you're in there, you stay sober, you show up on time, you exceed expectations and you ask them, let me learn, teach me how to do this. Teach me, let me try, teach me. And you, but you do it with humility and you like, let me become a good steward, a steward of every opportunity that comes my way. And when you do that, they'll give, don't tell them, Hey, I'm going to go start my own company or I'm going to start a web design company that specializes in this trade or that I'm going to be a CPA that specializes in this trade or that I'm going to serve as a consultant that specializes in this trade. There's so many opportunities, but so it, when you get into HVAC, you get into um, any home service, remodeling, construction, masonry, concrete. Dude, if you want to make giant money right now, have the attitude I just talked about, go get a job in a construction company and bust your ass and learn the business. And then what you do is you get, you got to get in financial position to be able to make a pivot. So don't drink your money away. Don't spend your money away. Save up. If there's one investment I'd recommend everybody take a look at as a young person, work a W-2 job and then look at buying a duplex or a triplex multifamily, small multifamily house. I have a customer called the Duplex Doctors, side-by-side -side realty. I have these real estate agents. They specialize in small multifamily properties. You can go buy a small multifamily property and when you apply for the down payment, you get to use the, the rent that you'll earn for the two other uh, rooms in your loan. So you might, if you're approved for a $200,000 townhome, you might get approved for like a $350,000 duplex because the rent, now you have to own or occupy it. But if you do that, and if you go do what I just said, so you work in construction when you're young or go work in a CPA firm when you're young, go somewhere where there's like big money getting earned, right? And they're either going to like keep promoting you if you keep executing, or you're going to be in position to be like, all right, it's time to start my own, right? And yeah, I really mean it, dude. So I'm on like this in, in Minneapolis, I'm in Lakeville. So I'm like the furthest South mm -hmm. suburb, right? And love or hate suburbs. It, I've been around growth because the neighborhoods are just growing all over the place for my whole life. That's, I've never really moved. And what you find is that my buddies who figured out how to do masonry and lay stone on walls and fix fireplaces, my guys that figured out what they went and worked doing lawn care and stuff like that. They all start their own business. They live in castles, castles with pole barns and their own equipment. Anybody can do that, but you got to have the expect excellence out of yourself. Be humble, execute, and be a great steward of every opportunity you're given. And that includes your learnability, the, your ability to absorb new information and go seek that knowledge. So that's the little bit that I always want to pour on there is that, there, there's a shortage of trades people right now. And if you get into that, like there's so much money to make, but there's no college degree that's going to get you there. Just go learn the business. Maybe get a college, you know, construction management degree or something like that. But college is good. But if you execute at work and you learn how to write and communicate and read and synthesize, um, I don't know, thoughts, questions, what reactions yeah. do you have to that? I'm, I'm, I can tell I'm getting older because... I, I hear what you're saying, right? And I'm almost smiling, kind of laughing, because I'm like, I wanted to ask you, and this is one thing it, it kind of gets to me now as I'm older, and you can give advice to people just like you literally just gave, gave them the steps, tell them what to do, the mindset, everything. How many people do you think listening or in general is actually going to try to do what you just said? Because you just laid down the blueprint. But how many people you think actually is going to apply that? That's the sad part. Yeah. I, you know, that cycle where good times create soft people, soft create people create hard times, hard times create good people. 
One of the difficulties right now in, I think, and I don't like to go to a big societal comment, but here's what drives me. I think your worldview, dare I go here a little bit, your worldview, I believe the Bible to a T. Like that's who I am. My faith is in Jesus. I believe, Darian, that you were made in the image of God to do purposeful work that when you get into heaven, there's some sort of reward for. The ultimate commandment, it says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. To seek justice, walk mercifully. And that Jesus said that the way you treat the least of these, the way you treat the people you have nothing to gain for, that's how I'm going to count. I just read in Luke this story where a rich man had a bunch of stuff and there was a, he had a big old estate and there's a guy sitting at the edge of his estate who was dead, dying, and crippled. They both die and go to heaven. The rich guy would always ignore this person who had needs. And they get into heaven and basically it's because one of them was faithful to God, he goes to heaven, the poor guy. And the rich guy who had everything and ignored everybody that came by him. So I believe that all of, that, that, that guy is in hell and there's a chasm between him and he's like please give me just dip give me some water please help my thirst cuz what hell is is separation from an eternal god so it's not out of fear i fear god though i do fear god i do believe there is a creator i believe if you look at creation you can see that there was a creator just like if i found harry potter on an island i'd be like hmm there's an author someone wrote that and i look at our dna and our systems and i'm like hmm that's an operating system that works perfectly. And life does not come from non-life. We've never seen that. This information, so so not that everybody has to agree with me, and that might be a little whack job for some people, but I believe that when people at least consider the fact that there's there is a purpose to your life, and I think it really does count. And I think if you're really honest about it, you know, Jordan Peterson, love or hate Jordan Peterson, um, if you listen to what Jordan Peterson's teaching right now, he's kind of teaching that like, even if you think Christianity is a joke, and even if the church is filled with hypocrites, when you read and you think about, if you read the Proverbs, it's like, there's so much wisdom there. And when you start to tap into this at minimum, don't we all want to be known as generous loving people. Maybe not. Maybe we just want to be envied, but eventually that runs out. Eventually we'll be old and ugly. Eventually it's not going to work for you. So I guess my point is at minimum, Jordan Peterson seems to point out that there's at least utility in trying to live out what the Bible specifically answers. You know, and I'll end with this. So I believe there's a purpose. I believe that people listening to this, I genuinely mean it. I think you were made for greatness I believe that Adam and Eve were made perfect and sin broke and we live in a cursed world. I think there's stuff and purpose and goodness within you that if you tap into it, nothing can stop you. In fact, God confused the languages in Genesis supposedly because there's nothing we couldn't accomplish. I think that's in us. I think that's there. And so if you if you listen, so that might be crazy. That might sound crazy. That's fine with me. But at minimum, why not? Like at minimum, what if, and, and I know this is Occam's razor, like, so if there is a God and you will stand before him accountable, why not try to do good? Like, why not? At minimum, I can tell you that rich people kill themselves for some reason. Rich people are depressed. They're addicted. They continuously seek more. And there's a reason why Jesus said it's going to be harder for a rich man to go to heaven because our heart gets consumed with stuff. So anyways, I don't want to preach too much there. I'm sorry I go off too much. Yeah. But if you're listening to this, that's what drives me. And I believe that God said that every word we say will be accountable, but he's a good, just God. He wants us to come back to him. He's a heavenly father. I think that there are people around you that you can bless by paying attention to him. I think that when you are a great steward of the opportunity of the life you have, I mean, I just think if you were to rewind 2,500 years ago, where just getting water is impossible, like things are difficult, and you found out all the margin we have in our life, and you thought, how do I spend it? 
Do I spend it maximizing it? Do I spend it at minimum trying to make myself into the to the best person who executes well and relates to people well? Back to that book, right? What's the wake you're leaving in life? So I'll conclude with this. The margin we have in our life because of how much there is in society, because we don't have to kill our food, we don't have to farm. Like just 150 years ago, none of us would have time to be listening to this podcast. None of us would have, we'd be out making food, right? That's what we would be doing. And I think because, you know, when Jesus said it's going to be really hard for rich people to go to heaven, like a donkey going through the eye of a needle I or a camel, I think what he was alluding to is that there is a time coming eventually, which our hockey stick of like goodness in this world has just popped really high, where it's going to be really hard to want to steward well the opportunity because all of your needs are taken care of. Like, so if you're hearing this, it is the easy thing to sit and just not do it. And that's okay. It's got, so I got a couple, th- another thing. I don't think you have to do this. I think that if you look at what's the goal in life, I think it's to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those things in your life create good things. It's funny, There's I have a friend of mine, um, and I get around them every once in a while. There's a gal, she worked at a very simple retail store in the Mall of America for a very long time. I have way more money than her. I have a bigger house than her. I have more than her. But she's so at peace. My, great, my, my wife's great-grandma just died. 95 years old. Her name is Ruth. She was the most full of peace, joy, love, kindness, faith. She is faithful. Like I got to say a word to her whole family. She's kept her family together. She related well, and she was just a good steward of whatever came her way. And that's what God tells us is that we're supposed to be faithful with whatever gets put in our hands. And God says that if you're not faithful with little things, How are you going to be faithful with big things? If you're not faithful with the things I give you that are yours, why would I give you other people's stuff? So to me, that can all be true. But I think that everybody has a sinful voice inside of them. I have a sinful voice. I see people, I judge them so quickly. Like I am so critical. I'm so cynical. I have like I have a sinful, dark rooted side of me that I'm I'm at war with. Constantly. And I think if you're honest with it, all of us have that voice. Now, I think this world right now is trying to convince people that that voice is worth listening to. And I don't think it is. I think that the voice to listen to is the one that says, love me, love others. Anyways, that's my big rant. (laughs) I don't know if you knew what you'd sign up for there. Hey, look, like, hey, I don't have to go to church this Sunday now. No, <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> the biggest thing for me from that too, and what I learned is a lot of people here, entrepreneurship is starting a business. And they, they, what happens is you see these flashy individuals out here, right? With these cars and clothes and everything. And people join entrepreneurship, one, for the wrong, wrong reason. And then two, people join it for the money, right? And for me, the reason why I joined entrepreneurship to be an entrepreneur was not for money, right? Like I said, I value time. It's not about money. It's more about time for me. Uh, So I say that to say is you don't need to be a millionaire, right? If you don't want to be, right? You don't need to, you know, work weekends if you don't want to, right? Literally just find that part of your life, the amount of money, you know, your goals, whatever makes you happy. That's what you need to go for. Uh, It just happens that entrepreneurship for a lot of people helps accelerate that process. But I know a lot of people who, you know, get into businesses and start and just, money hungry uh and that's that's for them that's perfect but for me it's about time and being able to give as much value as possible so um that's now, on the side but yeah i get it percent what you were saying <laughs> so so let me add on that all that being said i was an all-american football player i'm trying to crush my competitors <laughs> i'm trying to yeah. drive as hey. much net profit as i can so all that being said all that being said let's be clear 
you need to add so much value and get lots of sales and execute in a way that builds credibility over time. If you want to start entrepreneurship, exactly. here's what you don't get to sit back and look at all of this stuff. Like I drive a 2008 Ultima cloth interior, let's be clear. Um, but I have a 4,200 square foot house that I got to buy. I have four kids that I feed. I clothe and I help seven families live by, by feeding them. Um, we're, we, I am a very driven, I obsess about, in fact, probably my biggest problem is that if I let it, this business would consume me. It already mm -hmm. tries to nonstop. It would destroy my marriage. If I let it, it would destroy my ability to be a good father. If I let it like my mind, I cannot even kind of think about work after about six thirty, seven o'clock. If I turn it on, I'm not sleeping that night. I'm up all night and I could sit and write blog posts, make videos. I'm sick. Like I'm yep. sick. I go to church. It's relationship with God, relationship with my wife, relationship with my kids, maybe family and like other family, but it is my job, like to the detriment of, I got to get back in shape type of deal. But what it comes down to is you got to get it done. And I'm going to end with this thought. You don't get to be an entrepreneur unless you do two things. Number one, you got to sell. You got to get customers. You don't get to, how many smart, how many smart accountants have you met that maybe are better accountants than you because they can't go get customers. They don't get to have their own business. Like here's the frank gut thing, guys. There's a whole bunch of subcontractors in this world that know how to do flooring, that know how to do conk, but they don't get to make the massive amount of money that the house, the house building company, custom home builder builds, or that the remodeler builds. Those that know how to sell and, and position value as a guide, like there's a right way to do sales. If you can't sell, you don't get to do this. You don't get to do it. Even if you're in B2B, even if you're going to be a subcontractor, you got to go build. And then the second part is you got to execute. And in execution means you exceed at, meet or exceed expectations, whatever you sold. But on the other end of that is you have to find a valuable freaking thing. Like I meet too many people that are like, oh, I'm going to start a business where I rent out baby stuff. And I'm like, that's not a big enough problem to solve. If you want to have a successful business, go find big transactions that are big problems or at least valuable to somebody. And that's what I love about the accounting bookkeeping tech. It's why I like B2B because B2B, if I solve a problem, I just made a business flourish. Um, so if, but yeah. there is this practical thing, Darian, did you do some tax returns this last season? Yup. Yep. <laughs> you know how many websites I had to, I have to write. I still write blog posts. I have to make websites. Wow. I execute so I know I learn how to do hard crap. That's what I did. I went and found out. And if it wasn't hard enough, I found out how to do it better. And every time I learned how to do something, I was like, I want to do it. My four values would be trustworthy, competent, enjoyable, and rigorous. So if you want to do, if you want to, be, and this is where like join a construction company, learn where the big expensive problem is, find opportunity, find out how they execute, learn the business, and then doggone it, go out and sell, go get some customers. Is it easy? Nope. Nope. But you can't like every, I don't know, thought. Yeah, no, I'm just I was, I was I was laughing in my head. Yeah, no, you're you're 100 spot on. I want to make it very clear, right? I said it's about time and not money for me. I want to free up as much time as possible, right? I had this ceiling where I'm willing to work as hard as I used to work, right? For myself by all means, but in terms of income, right? I set a goal for myself to make when I get married, when I have kids, five, six, seven years from now. And I've crushed that goal six out of seven of my first months in business. The goal that I made for myself five years from now, I've crushed that goal every single month. So it's not about money for me, but now as a business owner, as an athlete, as someone who's hungry, if I see the opportunity to scale and grow my business and it happens to come with a, a bigger pot to pull from to invest in my family and my friends and everything I love, I'm going to go for it. So you definitely got to have that fight inside of you too. And just know that, you know, it, it's a good investment. You, you can expedite with being an entrepreneur. And I like what you said about thinking about business can be something to consume your entire life. I had to learn that early on. You know, you I have a thought in my head after eight, nine o'clock. My lady asked me about it. I'm like, don't do that because now I'm going to think about it <laughs> the entire night. Uh, so that's something I'm working with, too. But, but I love it, man. It, it's a good track to go. 
And uh, yeah, you do it the right way. You get a good team like Rob on the front line with the sales, like tremendously. That's the only reason why I'm able to accomplish what I'm able to do now is because I had a good jump start. When my website was launched with your business, I came out of the fences running. I'll never forget, I went to a NABA networking event and I met somebody there and I showed him my website and I just started my business in October and he was like, dude, your website looks better than the companies that I'm applying to right now to get a job. <laughs> so so you get you a good website, you get you a good welcome video and a good jump start by investing in a good team. Like that's it's gonna help you hit your goals way faster. So I just had well, to add that in there. Well, I'm honored. I I'm honored to have been able to to serve you guys. We take it pretty serious. Every customer we get a lot of customers and I'm building our team, we're like we're having a lot of success right now. And uh Every customer we have, it makes my stomach turn just a little bit. I guess that's the last thing is like my stomach churns because I take this seriously. Like I've concocted our four values. One is to be trustworthy. And in that means I'm going to pursue your best interests, like relentlessly. Everything from how I concoct my services to how I treat you. Um, now that means like we got complex projects going on. I'm doing your homework. It's hard. Like we got to communicate and project manage and all this, but being trustworthy, competent. I want to be really good at what I do. Enjoyable. You should enjoy when you're working with me and then rigorous. I don't like soft work. Like I want to make sure that if we can make it better, we can. Now it's hard when you get a bunch of business, right? But we're trying to get better at that. Um, you know, the last thing that I would just add here is that when I say sales and execution, if you want to really get a business started, you're going to have the unknown, you're going to have uncertainty and you're going to have fear. I'll never forget one of my first entrepreneurial friends that I had was Brock and Chase Jurgensen. They're best men in my wedding. Uh, they're my old, old friends. I went to high school with them. And Chase now has a pretty successful contracting business. And Brock has done a whole bunch of entrepreneurial things. But I'll never forget the first time that I watched Brock and Chase go out and do a like they were, I think they were demolished or they were putting together like a, some sort of building in their backyard and I'm like, oh, what are we, what are we going to do? We go back there and all of a sudden they just start freaking cranking on it and driving it and they just they like built this building in front of me. I'm like, really? Like you just dove in and you did. Well, now they had wisdom. They knew it. Like, I'll never forget the first time that I had, I was at Best Buy and the first three weeks they made me organize the printer aisle and I'll never forget the first time where they're like, all right, man, you be on the computer sales side. We're going to go to lunch. And it was my turn to dive in and try and sell a computer. And I'll never forget the first time I worked with Dylan Fredrickson, my first com or one of my first customers. It was like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do what I think is right. And there's uncertainty, and I might not have it all figured out. But if you want to have a business, you gotta swing the bat. You gotta try stuff. And that might mean you start for free. Hey man, I wanna start a tax and accounting business. Would you mind if I did your tax return with you for free this year so I could get some experience? Hey, I want to get into bookkeeping. Could I do your books for one year for free just so I can, and hopefully it'll be done right. We'll see. <laughs> hey, I want to build websites. Could I build you a website for free if you want to? All of my services I started as doing for very inexpensive. And then as I learned what worked well and I, you, you kind of do, you got to go out and try stuff. If you're not going to try stuff, you're screwed. Like if you're too afraid to even attempt to get in there, um, it's not going to work. And then in the construction side, I always laugh like I was just around ground tech. These customers of mine, they do excavation. And it was like, you see what these guys do. They take this giant excavator. They were going to put this, you, this pipe in. Now they know what they're doing, but I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, well, how are they doing this? They just take this ripper out and they rip the freaking road open. <laughs> I'm like... Yeah. You got to get in, you got to break somewhere. some, you got to crack some eggs to make some omelets. And if you're not willing to do some of that, you're not willing to try that and try small and tinker with it, it ain't going to work. But there's uncertainty and fear. And again, this that, that's why it's, the payoff in entrepreneurship is so high. You know, I can give myself a 60% raise right now. I just need to go get it. And that's cool. Darian can do the same thing. What do you got to do to get a 60% raise? What do you got to do to triple your income? We can do it. You got to go abide by the bureaucracy. But Darion, I really appreciate you, man. I've learned a lot through uh, our visit today. I really appreciate it. And uh, I think we'll do it again here. So any final words or thoughts that you have to anybody else that's still listening at this point? Yeah, I, this is my final thought. And it's to the accountants in the room, the people who are taking that traditional route. 
I, I just want to just invest in yourself. <laughs> and if you're working for these companies, just, just learn as much as you can. And just think about how much they charge their clients. And just think about if you can scale that down at a smaller level to apply it to a smaller business, how much you will be making. So I just want to put that out there. It's not easy to get to where I'm trying to go and where I'm at today. Best believe I spent the entire year uh, get doing free work, right? I did the tax returns, did like 40 tax returns, a charge for those. And then I did free consulting throughout the entire year until I was on the phone with a guy and he was like, how much do I owe you? I was like, nothing. He was like, no, that, that's not fair. Like, can I at least buy you lunch? And it was at that moment, about 10 months into me doing what I wanted to do on the side where I decided that it was time to launch my business and it was time to start charging people. So work on it, you know, side business on the side if you need to, you know, live in a house while you're renovating it, work on your brand, work on your image, but it's 100% worth the investment. It's got to believe in yourself and go all in. So that's my closing thoughts. <laughs> that's good. Hey, business owners, go to wigscpa.com. Here's a site right here. Check him out. He will help you out. Um, with proactive tax planning, bookkeeping, and accounting, and then we are feedback wrench. So if you if this was helpful, if you guys like it, you know, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, the podcast, whatever uh, thing you're actually on right now. And uh, Darion, thank you so much. Good luck. God bless, guys. Take care.